Today here on rumblestrip.net and 10 minute test drive, it's our home show. That's right, it's the 2019 Detroit Auto Show, or sorry, the North American International Auto Show. And it's an end of an era because this is the last Detroit Auto Show happening in January, in the winter. So in 2020, it's gonna be in the middle of summer, like in June. So we're gonna go from everyone complaining about it being too damn cold to, oh my God, it's so hot and humid and everything's outside, why'd you do this? Anyways, that's beside the point. Um, let's talk about our take on the 2019 North American International Auto Show. So to say that the show in its current guise is going out like a lion, absolutely not. Like a lamb, lamb to slaughter is kind of more like it. Uh, the first thing you notice when you walk in is just how many OEMs are missing. Almost all of the Germans are gone outside of Volkswagen. Um, you know, no BMW, no Mercedes, no Porsche, uh, no Mini. We'll call Mini German because they're owned by BMW, right? Uh, no Land Rover, no Jaguar, no Mazda. Uh, you know, the list of who's not here is probably bigger than the list of who is here. And it shows there's a lot of suppliers here on the main floor. Um, in fact, as we look across from where we're sitting here in the Lexus booth, excuse me, Denso and ZF are right there here are in like prime space, which would have been Volkswagen's last year, I believe would have been, uh, it would have been over there. So, and it's quiet, uh, the lack of, there, there's probably 50% less journalists here this year than there were last year. It's, there's just so much open space. It's, it's nice in a ways and it's very sad in other ways. But let's talk about some of the debuts that were here, some of the vehicles that we saw that were, you know, we liked, didn't like, and just in general. So things kicked off Wednesday uh, at Ford Field with Ford and they, they showed off their new 2020 Explorer. It was a pretty interesting presentation. It was pretty, uh, Pretty cool in the sense of like the whole floor of the stage. So think the width of a football field and probably 30 to 40 yards deep um, was all video screen. So it was a pretty interesting presentation. I uh, didn't get a lot of video of it, but I uh, got some pictures. Hopefully you're seeing a few of those. So they showed off the new Explorer, which is their new three row crossover, the latest version of the three row crossover. And then here in Detroit, uh, at this actual show, they showed off a hybrid and an ST version of it, as well as a police interceptor version of it. It's a good, it's a good looking three row crossover. Um, you know, you're gonna like it, you're not. It's a three row crossover, it's big, it'll sell well. Um, you know, fit and, fit and finish, it's a pre-production prototype. It is what it is, um, mostly good. Materials, I think are gonna be pretty spot on for the price point, but we'll see. The bigger news, at least from our standpoint, is the announcement of the Shelby GT500 Mustang for a couple reasons. A, they finally announced it. Uh, it ended up being supercharged where there had been talk a lot of talk about it being turbocharged. The other thing that's gonna get a lot of people talking is the fact that it's, at launch anyways, dual clutch transmission only, no manual. Now I think most of the people who are gonna argue about having a manual weren't gonna buy it anyway, so does their point really matter? And this will also go to another vehicle we're gonna talk about in a little bit. But over 700 horsepower is the number that Ford is giving. It's the 5.2 Voodoo motor with a 2.65 liter uh, supercharger on it. I believe it's an Eaton unit. Uh, they did say it and I just don't have it handy in, in my notes here. But you figure if the Voodoo motor is like 525, 526, but let's call it 525 horsepower, you throw the blower on there, say 10 pounds of boost, you're gonna boost your power by a little more than 50%, right? So you're talking close to 750 horsepower. Now, the only thing, the only reason I think they might go a little bit above 750 when they actually announce it is, well, we have more power than the ZR1 Corvette, and this is a Mustang. Pricing, of course, not announced, but assume it's gonna be close to $80,000, $80,000. Yeah, I mean, if, if the GT350 is at, in the uh, you know, high 50s, low 60s, this is gonna be even more, you know, probably close to 80,000. But uh, that'll be on sale later this year, probably September. Looks really good. And will we get a chance to drive one? Who knows, but I'm kind of off of Mustangs lately. I would like this one. 
So Ram showed off their new uh, heavy duty series, their 2500 and 3500 uh, series trucks. The big news is in the high output version of the Cummins, which comes only, I believe, in a one ton. And I'm not sure if you can get that in with, uh, you know, if you have to have the dually for it. But I know in dually form, it tows like 35,000 plus, 35,400 pounds or something like that. But it's 400 horsepower and 1,000 foot pounds of torque. I mean, that's crazy, that kind of crazy amount of torque. And I guess they've gone through and done like um, uh, pressed graphite block, lighter connecting rods that were also stronger, different pistons, tweaks to the turbo. Got, I mean, the, you know, the usual, like they basically did all the hot rod stuff, right? And they focused on torque because this is a big heavy duty truck and they're figuring people are going to be towing 15 to 30,000 pounds with it. So um, the trucks themselves look exactly like you would expect a Ram truck to look. The interiors are nice. I think Ram is currently doing the best truck interiors, both in half ton and in this uh, heavy duty size. And in their mega cab version, there's a way to tweak uh, when you fold down the seats, you can either just fold them down normally, or uh, if you pull a different lever that moves the uh, the seat base down and so you actually have a pretty flat uh, loading area inside the cab in the, in the back area it's pretty pretty generous size so um, that was nice it was it was well done looks the trucks look good and i'm sure they'll sell very well the other vehicle we need to talk a lot about that's getting a lot of pushback for some understandable reasons and again mostly from people who were never going to buy it anyways is the Toyota Supra. So that was unveiled here as well. Akio Toyota himself came to the show to debut it. And I've, I've got to say this, if you ever get a chance to see or watch a video where Akio is doing these things, he is an incredible presenter. He's very good, um, good sense of humor, just good presentation skills. It's, it's, it's great and it made, the, made it enjoy an enjoyable presentation. The vehicle itself, you know, it's gonna be zero to 60 in like 4.1. 4 it's a turbocharged inline six, which they're getting from BMW, um, which there's gonna be some pushback from that. Um, and it's only 335 horsepower, which seems low for a turbo inline six. You'd think they would have pushed that and tweaked it so it would have been over four, four, if not a little over. Um, everyone sells on power numbers, so that's gonna be an issue. The second issue is eight speed automatic only, no manual. Now, normally I'm not one to get into the argument of automatic manual. I, I really don't care the fact that you, you know, you have to have a manual, otherwise you're not fully engaged, it's bullshit. So you can be is just engaged with a dual clutch or an automatic, it's, it's about you and the experience. Um, but Toyota not putting a manual in this one, given the power number, I think is a miss on this in, in the sense of they could have really said manual inline six, not too much power makes it the perfect vehicle for driving on your favorite canyon road, your favorite mountain road, etc. But with an automatic, people are gonna have a pushback. I think it'll be fine. Um, the best way I've heard it described from a couple of people is think of it as the GT86, except scaled up a little bit. Uh, should be on sale in the next few months and pricing in, in the 50s. There is some talk that there might be a four cylinder engine in it, uh, turbo four at a lower price, but there was no confirmation on it. One of the interesting things that was actually announced at CES last week was Nissan putting a 64 kilowatt battery in the Leaf. Now that's going to extend the uh, range out to 225, 226 miles, which is right there with what the Chevy Bolt is doing at 238, at least, you know, EPA stated. You look, I, I went back and forth, like went and looked at the Leaf, went and looked at the Chevy Bolt, went back to Leaf, looked at the Chevy Bolt. I'm gonna say the Leaf has a little bit nicer quality interior and it definitely has more room in it. So given that a Nissan person said, well, when I asked about pricing, I'm like, well, we're Nissan, we're gonna be aggressive on pricing. So if they're gonna sell this thing for under 35 uh, without incentives, that's a pretty interesting price point for this. And I think that's a vehicle that probably 85 to 90% of the people could go out and buy and use in their daily life and not even have to think about it or worry about range anxiety. My only issue with both the Leaf and the Bolt is, and this is just from a personal use standpoint, 
is when you open the hatch, there is a pretty large drop to the bottom and the seats don't fold flat. In fact, there's usually a step by about this much between the hatch area and then if you fold the seats forward, the back seats forward, you have a step up about this. I'm a big thing, a big person about having flat floors, mostly because I have pets. So if I wanted to use this and haul my pets around, you know, no flat load floor, it's an issue and yeah, it's a thing, but that, that's a narrow use case. I think 99% of the other people would be like, it's great. So working to try and get one of those in when they come into the local fleet, just because I'm interested in it, right? I mean, am I excited about battery electrics? No, but they're interesting enough that I'd like to get one in. And so I'll be talking to uh, people I know at Nissan to see if I can uh, get one. Cause it's, not, it's a little difficult for me to get those, but so Kia is showing off their Telluride. That's their three row crossover. That's going to compete with the uh, aforementioned uh, Ford Explorer. It's a good looking vehicle. The front, eh, yes, maybe it'll grow on me, but you know, um, they have one version here that's all tricked out with like some adventure gear and uh, you know, sort of overlanding style, overlanding style. Um, it's a little cliche, but it's still, it's kind of cool. I mean, it's right on that edge, so. The interior is nice. I mean, it's very, if you're familiar with Kia and Hyundai interiors, it looks like that, except stepped up a little bit. I think it's gonna sell very well, it looks really good. Um, you know, it's another three row crossover, but we'll, we'll definitely have a chance to drive it here in the future. Now, back to some fun stuff. Subaru showed off the S209. That's the super special edition uh, WRX that normally the S editions have only been sold in Japan. I think it's exclusively they've only been sold in Japan. Um, but this is uh, being brought to the U.S. specifically um, on request to come to the U.S. with this. So 341 horsepower, it's been tweaked up, some extra aero kit and bodywork a little bit wider, the interior's done up a little bit. So uh, last year they showed off the STI TS, I believe is what it was. They had the carbon roof and a few other tweaks and pretty much everyone said if you're thinking like oh this doesn't seem right but it was like a lot of little things that made a big difference i think this is going to be in that vein where there's a little bit more power but again with some suspension tweaks and probably some extras uh, uh stiffening in some spots i think it's going to be a pretty interesting vehicle uh, that'll be on sale also i think in october november kind of time frame no price mentioned but uh, assume mid to high 50s for uh, for that one, or at least or in 50, 55 probably for that. Sitting here uh, at Lexus, uh, it's a tradition, find the LX and because of this tailgate, it's a great place to film. So Lexus showed off two different vehicles. They showed off their track edition of the LCF and it had some other styling tweaks. Looks, It looks really good, especially this uh, matte gray one with, the, with some of the carbon trim. It's gonna be uh, pretty good. And uh, I think it'll, you know, it'll sell a few, but it's for the super enthusiasts who actually do want to take their LCF out on track. Better suspension, better tires and such. So uh, pretty interesting. And then they showed off a concept. And when Lexus shows off a concept, especially in this, in this guys, um, look for it in about six to 12 months. And it's a convertible version of the, uh, the LC. Beautiful, as you'd expect. The LC is an amazing vehicle. We loved our time in it and um, you know, should be should be good. So GAC is here once again with a pretty big display, Chinese company. They were supposed to have vehicles on sale already in the US, it didn't happen. Now because of uh, some of the trade war stuff going on, that is getting pushed back even further. The big issue would be if current trade things going on, there'd be 25% imp import tax and that would kill their pricing. Uh, it is what it is, don't care about the politics right now. But what are the vehicles like? Uh, the styling is, generic. I mean, it's kind of like a little bit of everybody stuff thrown in, mix it together and it comes out. And the interior looks like very much five years ago, Hyundai, Kia kind of stuff. So it's okay. And if they sold aggressively on price, I'm sure they could do okay, even though they're literally starting from scratch with no brand recognition. The one thing that you do notice though, is from a material standpoint, in their assembly, whatever glue they use for putting vehicles together, the off-gassing on it is horrendous. I mean, as soon as you open a door or a hatch, you just get this waft of, of off-gassing, and it's like, oof. It, I mean, not only is it strong, it's just a really bad smell as well. So, um, will we see GAC here? Yes, eventually we will. 
Um, and I think their play in the U.S. is really going to be off of a strong battery play, but that's a different discussion for a different day. So that's going to wrap up the 2019 North American International Auto Show here in Detroit. Our final January edition of this, as we said, next year, it's going to be out in the summer, in the heat, in the humidity. So instead of everyone complaining about it being so damn cold, it's going to be hot and humid and it's going to be horrible again. But, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, going out like a lamb to slaughter. For this show, just the lack of people, lack of vehicles, a lack of manufacturers. Eh, it is what it is. It's like a super regional show at this point. But hey, it's the hometown, and you know, we're here. <laughs> and uh, overall, it was a good show. Got to catch up with a lot of people, saw some stuff that uh, hadn't had a chance to get in yet. So, in that sense, it was good. So, hope you enjoyed our wrap up of the 2019 Detroit Auto Show. We'll see you next time on rumblestrip.net and 10 Minute Test Drive.